I know it says on the board that we're going to harness the power of AI. We are, but you're not going to get that high-end Simwell uh, uh, presentation that showed all those different uh, models of different uh, things moving around that Andre put out yesterday, but you're going to get to see uh, a Simwell contributed uh, simulation that shows us uh, how to shoot down a hypersonic missile uh, using three different weapons platforms. Now, how does that have anything to do with harnessing the power of uh, AI? First thing I have to say up front, everything I'm going to give you today is unclassified. It either came from an open source or it's a reasonable estimation on our part. Uh, the team, Zolan Tech, Simwell Consulting, and AnyLogic put this together. Uh, could I get, uh, and I can't see, so I'd like uh, Steve Blantley uh, with Simwell to stand up, and I'd like Nicholas Geary. These are our folks that helped out on the uh, model, and I thank you very much. Our objective is we used a CRADA uh, mechanism. We uh, uh, put in a proposal to the Defense Intelligence Agency to try to get them to use AI, large language models, generative AI, to solve some of the daily problems that they have. The federal government has been using simulations for a very long time, but they only use them on very special things that have huge budgets. And they use think tanks like MITRE, and they bring in a lot of subject matter experts, and they bring in a lot of uh, you know, software guys, and they create a uh, very uh, government customized high fidelity simulations and they cost huge amounts of money. We're trying to get them to use, and the reason why they do that is because <clears throat> also they also have to use a whole lot of empirical data sets to get the robust uh, information that they need in uh, labeled data to get a good high fidelity simulation. Uh, Troy from the State Department show, is a good example of the amount of things he had to go to to get the data set that he needed to do his model. So one of the things that we have noticed that large language models, ChatGPT uh, and a few others that I'm going to mention later on, uh, they allow us to tap in to do a lot of that research up front if anything has been done similar in the past and leverage those lessons learned and those information sets. Now, there will be probably some gaps in the data that will have to be filled in with empirical uh, data, but now you're only simulating, you know, rather, you're only having to get small pieces of information to complete the big picture. But there's a good intersection in between AI and dynamic simulations that really hasn't been put to use. I've seen a few things on AnyLogic's website where they talk about using ChatGPT to come up with some of the code to fill in the blanks, uh, which isn't always correct, but it's uh, a good place to start uh, to get some information to complete a, uh, uh, a simulation. Now, DIA's mission is to provide military intelligence to the warfighter, defense policymakers, planners for intelligence community, and also to, for military planning and uh, weapons acquisition. And as I said earlier, the uh, value of having a high fidelity dynamic uh, simulation is it's accurate, it beats the risk down really far. And one of the things I've learned in the last two or three years working at NGA for Zolan uh, is we are advisors to the government on systems engineering uh, solutions for big IT problems. And being the guys that come up with the requirements to build these systems, we're automatically organizational controlled you know, pulled out uh, for conflict of interest uh, and not allowed to actually do any of the actual development. So it prevents us from doing prototypes to see, will this work or will this work? And they don't really want or know 
that they can use a simulation to substitute for that uh, prototype. So with that in mind, and remembering that uh, the government you know, only uses them for things like, uh, you know, I need to build a simulation for an F-22 because an F-22 costs almost $100 million, and if I crash it, building a simulator for five or $10 million, and it saves one F-22, it's worth the money. Also, we don't want to you know, fill the atmosphere with radioactivity, so what do we do? We take all that historical knowledge that we've had from all of our atomic weapons, and we put them into a Cray or a, a, very, or a quantum computer type of thing, and we do the simulation in there. But you have to have that huge, massive data set to have the confidence that you're going to make a weapon that will work when you need it to be. But we're going to try and convince them that, hey, if we get the CRADA, which is uh, a, a cooperative research uh, uh, activity, we're going to try and convince them that we can use AI to get those large, uh, robust data sets to uh, do that high-fidelity simulation. So if, to get the government, if anybody's worked for the government in the past and you're trying to get them to do something that they haven't done before or don't want to do again, is you got to give them a very compelling story, a very compelling use case to show that what you're doing can really save them a lot of money, a lot of effort. So I thought about this one a little bit and I decided, okay, we'll pick up a scenario that they've said multiple times they can't uh, do. And one of them was shoot down a hypersonic missile. I don't know if y'all have been watching the news, but that's a big concern. China has some hypersonic missiles that could, they call them carrier killers, and they're air denial uh, weapons that would keep our battle groups outside of a thousand mile or the first uh, island chain of, uh, outside of China and that would give them uh, the carte blanche if they want to, to come in and take over Taiwan if they wanted to. So that's a big problem. The government really worries about it. The guys at the Pentagon especially do. So if they don't give us another scenario, that's what we picked. Now, I almost didn't get up here on this stage because uh, any logic wasn't going to let us come because they really didn't think we could come up with this and they don't know how close they were to being right. Uh, I started working on this problem set using various AI to come up with stuff, and it was very hard to stay just on open sources and get the information I needed. But I did find enough information to put together a simulation of a DF-21 hypersonic missile. The uh, Chinese call them carrier killer, I'm not going to argue whether or not that they really can do what the Chinese advertise. They generally, you know, oversell their stuff. But we're going to make the assumption that it can do everything they say it can. So using that, we kind of came up with some kind of a weapon for interdiction. Now, right now, open source shows that we, the United States government, have come up with a 300 kilowatt continuous wave laser. It's a constant beam of light that uh, generally you can't see. I've exaggerated it in this picture. It's actually, you, it's an invisible light. And we've used it to shoot down small uh, rockets and uh, mortar rounds. And, but you have to keep that 300 kilowatt tracking uh, function on the laser on the target for at least two to three seconds. But it can be done. You can't look you can't come up with a system that's going to put a beam on a hypersonic missile that's traveling greater than five times the speed of sound to, for two to three seconds from any weapon system that it would be functional. So by just do, that definition, we can't use continuous wave lasers. But a broad search of the data out there on weapon systems, I came across a particular weapon system that was a laser weapon system, but it's called an ultra short pulse laser, and it fires for a length of 200 femtoseconds or 
0.002 nanoseconds. But that's basically a quadrillionth of a second. To, to do our model, we had to first model the missile. Now, needless to say, the Chinese aren't really big on putting a lot of their classified information out there on their missile systems. So how do you find out? Well, I looked and looked, and I did a lot of searches, uh, used a lot of uh, you know, chat GPT. I came across a research paper from the Naval War College, and I'll have all my sources at the end of this. And just to let everybody know, if you're going to try and take pictures of these things, you don't need to waste time taking pictures. Uh, the folks at uh, AnyLogic have told us they're, I don't know what time they're going to do it, but they're going to post all the uh, slides and the presentations uh, on their website. So just you can just sit back and listen. I looked real hard, couldn't find anything on the DF-21, but I did find something in this uh, war college, or naval war college, uh, uh, you know, dissertation that they said that the Chinese had reverse engine to get to create their DF-21. They had reversed engineered the U.S. Pershing II missile, which was a land-based missile that we deployed in Germany before the Soviet Union collapsed. <coughs> Excuse me, and. That missile system, the government's really bad about what they declassify once they call it obsolete. You can probably find a lot of plans out there for the neutron missile that was, not a neutron missile, but the neutron bomb that was considered obsolete by, you know, Jimmy Carter years ago. I found the actual operations manual for the uh, Pershing II online and downloaded it. Uh, also, I found a couple... Uh, scientific papers that came out from China that talked about how uh, they use uh, their glide uh, systems or reentry glide systems and got their um, equations that they used to show the flight characteristics. Now, needless to say, you may think I'm kind of smart, but really I'm not. Uh, and I barely remember half of the differential equations I learned in college and uh, definitely hardly remember any of the spherical trig that I had, but I got to relearn a lot of that. And I also used AI to help me through how to use the equations. Now, my problem was I couldn't use those high-level equations to automatically give me the flight characteristics in um, any logic. There may be a way, I don't know, I didn't have the time to learn, and so what I did was I crunched the numbers myself and put them in into an Excel spreadsheet. So needless to say, this is kind of a weird looking um, uh, arc that these missiles fire. The first part of it is a parabola, but there's three different equations that are used to get that flight pattern. So I put everything after I crunched the numbers. That's just one of the equations. And like I said, it's not just trigonometry. It's spherical trigonometry with force vectors associated with it. I learned a couple things. Uh, no, gravity is not a constant. It changes at the distance from the Earth. No, speed of light is not a constant. It also varies. And it doesn't vary a lot, but when you're talking moving this much and you've got to be dead on because you're shooting at something that's moving at 10 to the 15th, you know, correction, moving at five times the speed of sound and you've got a pulse that is 10 to the minus 15th femtoseconds, uh, you've got to be right on. So anyway, I crunched out the numbers. Now the visualization was going to be a problem, so we had to fudge it because you're not going to see a femtosecond pulse of a laser, whether you want to or not. So we had to exaggerate the length of the laser pulses, and we had to accelerate the flight of the missile, because even though it's flying at five times the speed of sound, it's a 15-minute flight pattern. You're not going to want to sit there and watch this uh, uh, flight schedule go for 15 minutes. So... These were our curves that came out to. 
uh, the calculation. We're pretty close. We're not perfect, but we're pretty close. These were our target specs. We talked about them. We looked at them. We learned a few things. We also uh, found in our notional, tar notional targeting characteristics that we probably couldn't hit the missile dead on the nose, but if we did did it dead on the nose, we'd probably have to do it five times the length of the engagement because the nose cone is the thickest part of the missile because it has to withstand the reentry temperatures of going through the atmosphere. But we did kind of come up with, hey, maybe if we went, you know, 15 degrees off to one side or the other, that you would get a much better engagement uh, profile. So we were learning, you know, engagement profiles, operational characteristics of what this thing would have to do if we were going to use it. We decided three platforms, an air platform. They've already tested the TUSPL, the Tactical Ultra Short Pulse Laser, uh, in a, using it, firing it from an airplane. So we assumed if you can put it on an airplane, then you can put it in a satellite because it's that small. And we decided we could put it on a ship also because definitely if you can put it on an airplane, you can put it on a ship. So we decided we we're going to base it on a ship, we we're going to base it on an airplane, and we we're going to put it you know, in a satellite for our uh, purposes of the simulation. So we're going to hopefully uh, get... The gut, we made one big assumption. We weren't going to talk about at all. We're not going to deal with any of the sensor platforms. We're going to make the assumption that the government, other you know, systems can see it from the beginning of its launch to the end. That's not a bad assumption. Now, whether it can actually engage it from the beginning to the end, that's another question. But that's not what we were going to put into the model. So... We figured that by doing this, if uh, the government didn't give us another scenario, we were going to run with this from the beginning to the end. Putting it all together, this is what it kind of looks like. We had a five-mile engagement envelope, whether we were on a ship or a plane, because you will get some attenuation by the atmosphere. Uh, I'll talk about that later if I have time, about uh, how you can... Uh, why this is not this particular USPL is not as uh, susceptible to atmospheric attenuation. Uh, you could get a thousand mile radius uh, if you put it in space. And I promise you a simulation. Here we go. And I'm wondering why it hasn't started. Here we go. See the envelopes around each of the uh, planes. This is a still shot. This is the uh, 2D, 3D. You can see the uh, um, dashboard there that allows us to vary the speed of the plane, the speed of the, mi of the missile, the speed of the ships. Here we have our missile taking off, following its flight pattern, got engaged by the satellite, got engaged by the first plane, the second plane engaged by the ship, and we didn't have it blow up the carrier in the end because all we wanted to do was show it actually engaged when it got into the envelope of each of the different platforms. So, create a cost today, about 35K. Uh, we're going to go for 600K from DIA to take it to the very end as, as far as they want to go with it. Uh, return on investment, um, what does a supercarrier cost? Four billion, something like that? Uh oh. Conclusion, this CRADA, if we can get the government to start doing hard problem sets using AI to get a close to the right answer, um, set of data to go into a simulation and work it to the end of the problem, you can save tons of money. You don't have to build four or five weapons prototypes and that one isn't quite what we want. Let's try this one. This one isn't quite what we want. Let's try that one. You know, it's just, it's huge what you can save. 
Um, we're looking forward to the potential of transforming the landscape of the military. Uh, like I said, we wanted to have a compelling story to make us pay attention. These were the sources I used. These were the different AI platforms. I uh, used Wolfram Alpha to give me some of my math. Then I had to go to Microsoft Math to explain what Wolfram Alpha was telling me because I for, didn't, didn't quite understand it yet. I used OpenAI and IBM Watson for primarily for my uh, large language models. Your questions, folks. Was I fast enough? And by the way, I have a few other slides I'm holding to the end to show some of the hard problems we overcame, if we have time. Yes, sir. Hey, right here in the back, thank you for the presentation. Um, so one question that I have is, did you run into any sort of difficulties in navigating the different classifications in the military sphere? I know a lot of I stayed off, uh, the question was, did I have any problems navigating any of the difficulties uh, with the, the military uh, classification uh, limitations. I stayed off of all classified networks for all of my information gathering. I kept track of where every piece of my information came from. I can walk back to everything, every piece of stuff that's in my slides and show that every bit of it is in the open source. Now, some of it's behind a pay door, a paywall, like a lot of scientific papers, you have to pay to get in there, but it's still Anybody that's willing to pay the fee can get that information. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, real quick, I'll go through some of the stuff. This is my process. I did a little R&D, did search prompts, figured out, you know, the whys behind things by using the AIs. Then when I'd find out some information, I tried to break it down. If I couldn't understand it, I went to other AIs to help me understand what I had pulled out of other sources. Why the pulse laser is so bet, much better than the continuous lasers is it's using petawatts of power. When I talked about the continuous laser being 300 kilowatts, think about it. You know, you're all IT guys, you know, kilo, mega, giga, tera, petawatt. Lot of power. That power is so huge as it goes through the atmosphere, it ionizes a path through the atmosphere. And by ionizing the molecules, it basically turns the atmosphere into a filament for the laser. That's why you can go much further. We picked five miles as the envelope to engage because we've already, the government's already tested it out to one mile and they're intending to test it out to five miles shortly, I made the assumption that it's going to be successful or otherwise they wouldn't have spent the money to set up the new test. They already expected to be able to work out to five miles. Put it in space, made it go forever, basically, because there's no atmosphere to get in the way. How this pulse laser is so devastating, that huge amount of energy when it hits a surface it ablates the surface. And to show you kind of real quick, when it ablates the surface, as you can see here, notice that off to the right, it's got uh, that weird looking uh, electric field and magnetic field. It basically splatters in the EM spectrum. It sends out X-rays, sends out uh, gamma rays, sends out all these other different uh, electromagnetic pulses. It doesn't just poke a hole in the nose cone, it fries the sensor and guidance systems in the missile at the same time. And just in case it didn't, one of the things we learned and we recommended is <coughs> to have it engage multiple times because if you engage it in one spot and it blows a hole in it, what if there's nothing behind there? So if you hit it in five or six places, along its uh, fuselage, you're definitely going to hit something that'll take it out. So those are some of the things that we learned that are above and beyond. We also decided to make sure we showed by the simulation, even though you may have a thousand mile range with the satellite, 
you're only going to get to shoot at it that one little bit that it's outside the atmosphere. And that's what this, this uh, image is showing. So we would recommend that you would have, you know, multiple, uh, you know, platforms in the sky if you really wanted to completely cover and, you know, get more than just this much. Now I'm done. Any other questions? Thank you very much.